When you think of punk rock, you might think of this. Well, Sheena is a punk rocker. Or this. But do you ever think of this? Happy summer, everybody. Lovely out there, right? So nice. Although I haven't lived in Portland that long, and I worry a little bit when it gets hot. Because I've noticed a lot of people in town enjoy the all-natural deodorant. I don't understand it. All-natural deodorant to me is a lot like all-natural birth control. So if you seriously think it's working right now, you're probably a pregnant hippie. Uh, such a mean start. Speaking of pregnant hippies, a lot of my friends are having kids lately. We ask because the core tenets of punk rock seem to be a big part of today's comedy scene. In comedy today, there is a DIY ethic, a rich and vibrant scene, and a willingness to speak truth to power and tackle uncomfortable issues. Today, on The Future of What, we ask whether comedy is the new punk rock. Later on in the program, we'll hear from comedians Hari Kondabolu and Nathan Brannon. But first, we're going to go talk to the comedian you just heard in the clip we played, Amy Miller. Amy, welcome to The Future of What? Hi, Portia. How's it going? I'm great. I'm so excited. You are the newly minted champion, Portland's yes. funniest person. Yep. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm so excited. That's Everyone so cool. was super funny, so it's a huge honor. Yeah, and you stood drinks for the losers. <laughs> I did buy drinks for a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, you know, one for me, one for you, one for me, one for you. <laughs> So, Amy, we asked you to come on because you are familiar with both the punk and comedy scenes. So I wanted you to just set the stage for us by describing punk rock in your words. Punk rock to me is very DIY, I would say. The punk rock experience is sort of close to my family. My brother is in and has been for many years, almost too many years, uh, (laughs) if you ask his wife. In a band called Sam I Am, which is a pop punk band out of the East Bay in California. And he was sort of one of the bands that started up Gilman Street. And at the time, you know, I was very young and I didn't exactly know what was going on. I knew that there was something huge happening, partially because I was was in the church at the time, raising myself a good Baptist girl. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and um, and I know I could tell by their reactions to everything I and mean, how angry and worried the church was that something really major was happening. Oh. Whereas, you know, at first I kind of thought he was just going to this warehouse to get wasted with his friends. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, especially that movement, spe- specifically in the East Bay, was really about like finding spaces to create and perform that were not initially performance spaces is really kind of about innovation and doing things on your own. And I think that we're seeing a lot more of that in the comedy scene, especially in Portland, but everywhere with comics sort of finding pop-up spaces to do stand-up comedy and moving the art form in general out of its previous primary home, which is the comedy club. The sort of old guard of comedy clubs. It's getting, you know, it's a little grimier. Comics are starting to look different, which is great, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and 40 years ago, if someone asked you to draw a stand-up comic, we kind of all know exactly what he would look like. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just uh, as an art form really kind of branching out. And people are getting a little bit more creative with it, with it which is really exciting. So do you have any particular DIY experience yourself? Like, do you book your own shows? Like, how do you interact i do yeah i book i book a couple of shows i have a podcast that i don't record as often as i should (laughs) but and i have yeah i have a talk show and just also like a late night stand-up show that happens at midnight once a month and that is is pretty punk rock it's just sort of a chaotic midnight show at a clown bar (laughs) um that I just sort of created and gave it this religious theme. It's called Midnight Mass. And yeah, I guess those are kind of the things that I do. I mean, I have friends kind of branching out a little bit more. I know that a lot of the people that I know who spend a lot of time on the road have to find interesting ways to supplement their income. So, you know, in comedy, merch is obviously a big thing like it is in music. Mm -hmm. Um, So you see a lot more people producing their own albums and, you know, doing it on the cheap so that they have something to sell when they're on the road. I'm going to work on a set of pillowcases. (laughs) 
awesome. With my face on it that yeah. says I'm sleeping with Amy Miller. <laughs> it's perfect. That's like something people like to say, and it's almost never true. So <laughs> I'll just put it right on that, right on there. Just make it, make it true. <laughs> make it true. I can't. I don't always want to. Exactly. So <laughs> you, it's much less work for you that way. Yeah. Yeah. How did you yourself get started in stand-up? Um, I had a little bit of an emotional breakdown. <laughs> Just had a really bad year, and so I had some things to get off my chest, but couldn't inf- afford therapy. Um, <laughs> oh but also, it was a little bit of a fluke. I was a comedy fan, but not like you w- Like most stand-up comics, when they start, they kind of already have the sort of lay of the land. You know, you're going to talk to Hari Kondabolu later, like... There are comics starting now as open micers that absolutely know who he is and follow his career. So, like, as a kid, I had watched Eddie Murphy and Bill Cosby and stuff, but I didn't really know anything outside of that Mm -hmm. about what was happening with stand-up. At the time, I had sort of made a goal for myself to get over my stage fright uh, by the time I was 30 or in my 30th year. (laughs) And... Don't know why that's the thing that I chose. Kind of got bullied into it by a friend who was going to some open mics. I mean, really after the first time, which was just three minutes at this laundromat in San Francisco on Folsom Street, (laughs) where many of us get our start, I was sort of hooked right away. I mean, I felt like I was going to die, probably, (laughs) because I was not accustomed to being in front of people. Right. And... I also was not a person who ever talked about my feelings. Uh Uh, So combining those two things all at once was pretty crazy. Wow. What do you think it was that hooked you? Was it the feeling of, like, was it the laughter or was it? Part of it was the laughter. A lot of it, to be honest, was the community. At the time, I'm living in San Francisco and I am from the Bay Area and I had fallen on hard times, you know, like a lot of people did around 2010 and comics were a group of people that I didn't have to really explain that to. Like, they were all on hard times, you right, know? Right, right. Nobody was really doing great. So <laughs> it was nice to have this really accepting community of people that were also sort of struggling, and this was how they got through that struggle, was talking about it and making people laugh about it. The laughter certainly helped, but the community, I think, was a big part of it. So would you say it's sort of like a punk rock scene or like really any kind of scene? I mean, I'm thinking about we've talked about scenes on this show before, indie rock scenes, the sort of alternative rock scene of the late 80s, early 90s in America, you know, just having a community, like feeling like these are like minded people. These are people who get me. Absolutely. And I mean, not just a community, but an identity to some extent, you know, and I think especially at that time, I was really looking for something like that. Like, what am I doing with my life what how do I stand out what makes me different from other people and you know kind of adopting this whole new thing was really crazy and also a weird choice like what a strange thing to want to be like I'm a stand-up comic you know right it's like even now that comedy is so popular and it's going through this this new boom people still look at you like you're crazy you know like why like you don't do that you know like Well, that's funny because I think that's sort of part of the momentum of comedy right now because we're in this time when alternative comedy in particular is so – it's just everywhere. It's it's appearing in so many places in podcasts and, you know, you see people on TV shows and you hear them doing voiceovers in movies and just suddenly, like, their stand-ups are everywhere. Yeah. And I feel like it's starting to get a little bit better because I really think that era that you were talking about where it's like basically there was Eddie Murphy, there was Steve Martin, and there was, you know – somebody else like one other person and that was it and if you had said like I'm going to be a stand-up comic they're like oh you're going to wear an arrow through your head yeah like what yeah I mean it's not that there weren't more comics there are plenty there were plenty of guys and women you know in comedy clubs or performing in the cat skills you know like you always hear about those guys like Shecky Green or whatever there were a lot of comics there were just fewer inroads to exposure and now we have so many, you know, that now it's like when my mom asks me what my long term plan is, I actually don't feel like as panicked as I might have, you know, 40 years ago because there are so many options for how I can make money, like podcasts, like you mentioned, like, you know, you can go on the road, you can do voice work. There are just so many other places that stand up comics pop up. Um, Absolutely. That it's a little bit easier to get by, but. You know, I mean, I think like the punk rock scene, I mean, you do kind of just start with nothing, you know, like those those guys sort of 
like you said before, like just pick up your instruments. And even if you don't know how to play, you just get some noises out. And we kind of do that with comedy for a long time until we figure out how to make it marketable, which has, you know, I mean, punk rock itself is totally, you know, commodified now. I mean, right. Warp Tour is one of the biggest, you know, and it's <laughs> like, I mean, it's not really a fringe scene anymore. And I think that that's happening with comedy, too. Well, Amy Miller is 2015's Portland's Funniest Person. Yes. Yeah. So, Amy, thank you so much for being with us on The Future of What. Thanks, Portia. We're so cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're so cool, cool. We're so cool, yeah, yeah. F*** too, cool schmuck. You're listening to The Future of What. In just a minute, we're going to talk to comedian Nathan Brannon. We'll be right back. Nathan Brannon is a Portland comedian and brand new father. Nathan, yay. yay. Welcome to the future of what? Thank you. I'm so happy to have you here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I wish we had your baby. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. He knows more about being <laughs> a celebrity than I do. <laughs> you are. You are a huge celebrity in Portland. <laughs> Me? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you are, you are a former Portland's funniest person. Yeah. Which is very cool. Now I'm all washed up, but oh, back man. then it was it was a good time. That was the heyday. Yeah. So tell us, what we're talking about today basically is, is comedy the new punk rock? And the reason that I'm saying that is basically because punk rock, you know, originally was something that people felt like anyone can do. Like that was the whole point. It's like, I've got something to say. I don't know how to play this guitar. I'm going to get up on stage and just do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's funny. I was thinking about that. How, yeah, you can do it all yourself, like, uh, like not to be all, like, cliche and, and say, like, every band started in their garage and stuff, but, like, with comedy, you can. You can just put it out, whatever you're thinking about. If you put it out there so it translates to other people, there's no limit to what you can do. Like, when I first started, me and some buddies, we had a green screen and some editing equipment, and that was it, and we started making sketches, and I think some of them are still up. Really? Like, it's nuts, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're not the greatest sketches, but, yeah. I mean, like, we thought it was funny. We didn't have to go through anybody. Right. Just you just did, did it. it. Yeah. Absolutely. And now, when did you start actually doing stand-up? Like, did you have to get up the nerve to just go to an open mic? No. I guess my very first time... I, I wasn't really a comedian back then. Like, I, I was hanging out with some fraternity brothers of mine, and, like, we'd always have fun at the lunch table and stuff. And a couple of them were, were actually in a band, and they played at this coffee shop. And I went to go support them, and their last five minutes, they stopped what they were doing and donated their last five minutes to me doing stand-up. And I had no idea they were going to do that. Oh, and, my God. Uh, the person running it was like, all right, come up. And then they got the whole crowd to start like, yeah, get up there. And they were like, just talk about what you talked about at the at the lunch table. <laughs> and that was the very first time. And, like, they laughed, and I was just like, I was hooked yep. after that. The laugh got you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Way totally. Back. That's what Amy Miller just said. She said, yeah, the it's laughs something. get you. I, you can't even really describe it. It's just, you know, like if you say something you mean to say and then people are like, ha, yeah. It's like that. This is what I want. This is what I want to do. <laughs> I'll be doing this forever. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> From now on. Forget it. Bye, mom. Calling mom. Like, yep. forget it, mom. This is it. Let me rip up this degree real yep. quick and write some jokes on the back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, mom. <laughs> Send her a letter. So I found this quote from Chris Gethart, which I really like, because I think it's perfect. So it says, someone once described punk rock to me as not about violence or crazy outfits. It's people asking why things have to be the way they are. Yeah. Right? I and I was like, lot. oh, that is comedy right now. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I, uh, I recently, like I have a joke 
that I, I kind of aim to do that. that it's, it's not finished yet, but like I want people to start talking about it. And I was in a place where it's a very, very conservative uh, area. And I was doing the joke, uh, uh, I don't want people, it's not finished, so I don't want to talk, tell people <laughs> what the joke's about. That's yeah. okay. It could be looked at as unpatriotic. Uh-huh. I, it, like if you just look at the first sentence of it uh-huh. and I try to get people to go with me on right. it and asking a lot of questions. And I did it in this super conservative area and they hated it until I got done with the joke and I go, OK, what, what did you not like about it? And they started telling me all this different stuff about why they didn't like it. And uh, basically it boiled down. They, they were accusing me of being a bad American because of the joke. And we started going back and forth like, why is it? Why is it like that? Why do you automatically assume like you just applauded for me. I have a joke about uh, if my baby fell in the outhouse, I was just leaving there. <laughs> and they they applauded that, right? They cheered it up. Oh, yeah, the hell with that baby. Yet this this joke, now I'm a terrible person. Right. And uh, a couple of veterans came up to me and shook my hand and agreed with me. And then when I was leaving, there were a group of people smoking outside that were having a debate about the joke I just told. Like, what does it really mean to be an American and all this different stuff? And that's it's so crazy to think oh about God. that stuff comes from material. That's amazing. I yeah. mean, that's like really, that's like the best thing you could possibly do, right? Yeah, right? Like, like, like I already have an album I've already recorded, and there's a lot of other stuff. And after a while, you don't want to just make jokey jokes just for the sake of, oh, yeah, they'll laugh at this. Or, you know, right. you would like for people to talk about it or start a discussion or something. So let's take a minute right here and listen to a clip from Hannibal Buress show. Bill Cosby, pull your pants up, black people. I was on TV in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, it was great women, Bill Cosby, so kind of brings you down a couple notches. I don't curse on stage. Well, yeah, you're a rapist, so... <laughs> So, so there's a situation where we have a guy who himself is not, you know, super, super famous. Yeah. But he's absolutely taking on one of the most beloved comedy icons. And I think, you know, I think that speaks to exactly what we were talking about. I mean, at this point, yeah. comedians are kind of speaking truth to power. Like, that's where it's at. Yeah. You, you should be able to talk about anything. And, and, and that's the thing. Just because, you know, he's a legend and stuff doesn't mean you still don't question why do I have to listen to this dude if he's doing this and, and stuff like that? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't ring true, right? So, right. Uh, and it gave, <laughs> I think that's a perfect example. It gave people something to talk about on the street afterward, which is what everybody ended up doing the second the show was over. Oh, yeah. So, was, I mean, that was everywhere yeah. on the internet. I mean, and then you think about a lot of stuff, at, like with, with the fallout of it, there's a lot of there's a lot of women out there, you know? Like, they address that. If he hadn't have actually said that, stuff in that clip a lot of people wouldn't even have given anything a second thought Mm -hmm. and they would just be living out their lives like nothing happened yeah you know that's i mean he made a big difference yeah it's kind of wild it's crazy to to think that that comes from comedy and stuff it it makes you proud to be a comedian and be well not be in the mix but at least attempt to be in the mix of, of all that stuff going on right where it's like back in the day I think it's so weird. On, on Cosmos, they talked about, like, back in the day, they have places like coffee shops and stuff where people would go, and it didn't matter what kind of status level you were at. You come and you exchange ideas and everything. And that springboarded a lot of, like, exploration and, and thought on in different kinds of discourse. And I think it's pretty cool when jokes, comedy can serve that same purpose. Totally. I think it has a good uh, way of disarming or taking down those walls that people put up in between their ideals and, and talking to people about them. Like, yeah. it, it makes the discussion, though, is a... Uh, icebreaker is a terrible word to say <laughs> for it, but that's... Are you ever afraid? Do you ever go anywhere and perform in front of an audience and just think, oh, crap, I really can't do this bit tonight? Not so much I can't do it, but more like I'm going to have to deal with a lot more when I get off stage. For for a while now, I, I've always made a point, if I can't, if I'm not willing to talk to somebody who has a problem with me or, or what I said after the show, if, I, if I'm if i not willing to stand my ground on it, then you know, I won't even, I won't try to mention it and stuff like that. And I feel like that's what's happening. I feel like people, it's changed so much because I feel like people are now going to comedy clubs to get that kind of an experience. Yeah. Not yeah. just, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to go and get drunk and laugh at some 
funny like dick jokes. Yeah, I feel like that's how it used to be. I mean, and even if you if you look at like the outrage over some comedians right now over things that they've said, like if you think about the the reason people are outraged is because they know what kind of power that that can potentially have mm-hmm. behind it. Like they they're they're mad. It's you know it's mainly towards famous people, but they assume that, like famous comedians, but they assume that the stuff that these comedians say, people will internalize it. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's it's that kind of powerful. Like the fact that people are getting upset at all. You yeah. Know, which yeah. is pretty cool. And you have a joke that you're doing recently that I really like that's about your white son, you know, son who looks white, right? He's, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's biracial. But you being a black man sitting in a park holding a white baby, but you know, what oh, looks yeah. like it, a white baby to people. And it's like, so you bring your race into comedy of uh, course. And, you know, because it's part of your experience, it's part of your life. But, I mean, I think that's so interesting in this community. I mean, Portland is like one of the whitest cities in America. I'm finding that out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it took me decades, but I think I think it might be a little white yeah, here in Portland. Just a little. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I like to talk about stuff Yeah, that, that comes from... I learned that a long time ago when you talk about things that are from your personal life, if people get offended or are really upset, and it's like, oh, well, you're getting mad at my life. So, I mean, that doesn't change anything. So it's <laughs> you can think whatever you want. But isn't that interesting that that is, I mean, pe- that's what people in comedy are doing right now is they're actually talking about their life experiences. They're not just trying to whitewash it, I mean, literally whitewash it, or just <laughs> be sort of like inoffensive or like I wouldn't want, I just want to tell a joke. I don't want to have anyone think about what I'm saying. Yeah, I, man, I I see, I used to see a lot of comedians do that like when I was first starting. And like as, as time goes on, you end up just going through the motions if you're not really trying to make it something that you are still excited about. If you're just, oh, this will make them laugh, like after a while, you do it long enough, like I'm pretty sure all the other comedians on the show, like you do it long enough, you can go, oh, yeah, I know how to make people laugh mm-hmm. at this point. That's not that's not what's going to keep it fresh and, and stuff like that. You you keep challenging yourself to be more honest and and, and have it resonate with everyday people, mm-hmm. I think. And do you, are you finding that? I mean, you you gave that example about that particular joke, but like especially with the race stuff, like are you finding people saying stuff to you about that after the show? Yeah, on both sides. Both <laughs> I, sides. It's so funny. Yeah, I, I never really would have expected people to be like some people do get like because I I talk about it. I don't really bite my tongue about being black here, and, and you know, and and just in general, especially not anymore. And like. Uh, some people come, oh, I, I felt that was a little too too biased. I was like, of course it was biased. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you think? I'm gonna I'm not a politician. I always tell right. them, I'm not a politician, I'm a comedian. Right. Like if you don't like it, that's fine. But I I don't know. I, I get people it's it's nice when it speaks to people. Like we were I was at a a club recently. And I was talking about being a black dad and, like, all the things you deal with just by being... Like, it's already hard enough to be a dad, like, the way right. society looks at you as a male trying to take care of a baby. And then add on top of that, like, being a black dude, so now, like, the stereotype is you're not even there. You're right. not even there to be, uh, you know, a bad dad, so... Uh, <laughs> you're already a bad dad. Yeah, you should yeah. be, like, at a bar or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, right off the bat. Why? And so I love it when there's actual other black dads in the audience mm-hmm. and... Uh, they come up to me and because there's not a lot of places you can just talk that stuff out. You yeah. know, you can't just go <laughs> have a have a support group of black dads <laughs> <laughs> and talk about going to the store that day and how, how yeah. rough it was. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. They come up to me and then they tell me their stories and like we, we trade back and forth. And it's, it's real awesome. Like all this stuff is coming from my mind, you mm-hmm. know. Like, yeah, just to think about that, it's crazy. And resonating with people. I think that's amazing. And I feel like that's how it used to be with punk rock. You know, it's like yeah, people saw a band and they just saw them get on stage and just play some crazy stuff. And like they thought, I can do that. Or, like they're speaking to me. Yeah. What they're doing, what they're saying, that's mine too. And yeah, and and the things that they, they talked about and stuff, kind of, yeah, the same way with comedy. Like people took that stuff and they started talking about it in, mm-hmm. in other places, like yeah. in bars, coffee shops, all this different, on the street, having conversations about stuff that they didn't have the day before. Yeah. You know? Uh, I think that's really awesome. It is. It is. Nathan Brannon is a Portland comedian, and he is a professional black dad. So if you would <laughs> like to get into his support group. <laughs> Going pro, everybody. <laughs> NathanBrannon.com. <laughs> Nathan, thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
All right, hello, and welcome back to The Future of What. We now have in the studio with us Adam Triplett, the assistant manager of the local Portland comedy club Helium, which is awesome. And we also have the lovely Amy Miller back with us. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. So, Adam, talk to us a little bit about the options comedians have today for live performances. For live performances? Well, you have the bigger comedy clubs, places like Helium or the parlor in Seattle, the punchline in San Francisco. Those are kind of the big, big venues you can get to. Mm -hmm. But now there's a lot of places where you can, you know, just set up bars. There's comedy nights all over. There's always stage time everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the the big comedy clubs. There's places everywhere. How have you seen comedy change in the last few years? Like when you, since you started working, that's exactly what I've seen change. Is that is that move? There's all there's stage time all over the place, oh, rather wow. than just being at you know a couple open mics. I think there were like two or three open mics at first in Portland that I that were really kind of on the radar, and now there's there are mics everywhere that you can get to. Right. Yeah. So when you guys book people at Helium. Have you seen a change in the type of people that you're booking over the last few years? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, just if for nothing else to see the caliber of comics and because they get all this stage time, they get better very quickly. Mm-hmm. And you'll see people who six months ago were nowhere near the point where you'd, you'd even consider booking them. They can, they can rise up very quickly and get on your radar very quickly. Wow. So now talk about the audiences. How have audiences changed? I think audiences, I, I mean, the, there's there's a stereotype in Portland that the audiences are very smart here. Uh-huh. And I think that that's true for the most part. Uh-huh. But I think that there are some things that Portland could really work on. Uh, <laughs> what, what? Tell us so that they're listening to the radio so we can tell them. This um, is what you need to work on, Portland. Just, uh... They get very tight. They're not willing to hear somebody out on a lot of things. Oh, they'll, really? they'll. It's kind of if you lose them in the first couple lines, they're not going to follow you the rest of the way. But would that be like an ultra PC sort of thing? Like, is it, if somebody s- seems like they're coming across as kind of like we were talking about Amy, like you know, a little bit non PC in some way, that they're not going to go there with you, or in, is it the opposite? If if you start talking about something more racy, they're not interested in going. I think that it's a PC thing, but I think in, it's not that they get offended for people who aren't at the show. Like they gotcha. get, they they're gotcha. they're worried about they're worried that they, I understand why they do it because your fear is that you're gonna you're gonna like be caught laughing at something, and then all of a sudden it's gonna take some <laughs> left turn and it's gonna feel like a rally, and then you're the one who was laughing at this monster oh, and man. you endorse this and yes, you encourage you this. this. And I I understand that, but trust the performer. I That's guess so interesting. is what I would say. That's so interesting because I feel like you know in the era of Andrew Dice Clay, nobody was thinking that. <laughs> right. Like they were just laughing at him. They thought he was hilarious. Right. Well, again, Portland crowds are smart. <laughs> So they're not those people. Right. No. I gotcha. They're the other people. That's interesting. (laughs) That's funny. So this year was the fifth year for uh, Portland's Funniest Person competition. Yeah. And that was held at Helium. And so I judged that for two nights in the semifinals, and I saw that exact same thing because I thought a lot of the people who came up and started talking, they would often make disclaimers (laughs) to the audience like, no, don't worry, I'm not going to say something racist. Even though this joke starts out in this way that you're not sure, like they're like, don't yeah, worry, Portland. Yeah, they've been Portland. conditioned. They've yeah. been conditioned by crowds that they feel like they have to. They have to brace the crowds and say, yeah. "Stay with me on this, please." Yeah, because I'm not going to leave you out in the cold. I was really surprised right. because when I've been to comedy shows in other towns, nobody does that. It's not. Yeah, a thing. it's interesting when you go on the road too, and you've been so trained and. You find yourself in like Boise, Idaho, going like, "Oh, sorry for saying bitch," and they're like, "We don't care." Yeah, I don't know why. They're like, "What? Why did you stop this joke?" Yeah, (laughs) and they're like, "Bitch." Portland comics perform differently in Portland than they would in other places. Sure. Well, ideally, you should, but there's always like you know a couple days that you sort of forget, or you find yourself traveling with like these kind of like buzz phrases you know like mm-hmm. you find yourself in texas saying heteronormative and they're like we don't know what that is <laughs> no offense to texas but right. i mean along with the very progressive politics in portland there's also like a trendiness of it and there mm-hmm. are all these buzz phrases that we start to put into our stand-up and then when you go to other places they're like no <laughs> Can you be raunchy? Like, right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think audiences are getting much savvier, and that's 
the good part of the current boom. Mm -hmm. Like that's a positive part of it. But like any other boom, you know, I mean, it happens in music too. You're always going to have sort of your posers, I guess you would call it. Mm, <laughs> like people yeah. that know, oh, I've seen Amy Schumer's TV show or whatever. So I know that stand-up comedy is a really cool thing to do now. But they don't all necessarily like it or get it or want to be there. It's just like, this is what I've heard people are into. So totally. I'm coming to check it out. So there's kind of a, you know, an unfortunate flip side to it. But, you know, if you have someone like Hari and he sells out a show, for the most part, people are there to see him because he's found a niche. He's found an audience. And that's great. But there's also a certain number of people who are just going to wander into the comedy club because they know that that's what is a really cool thing to do right now. And there's a sense of entitlement that comes along with that. You know, it's like, I didn't research what kind of comedy you did at all, mm -hmm. but I have some expectations. And if you don't meet them, <laughs> I'm going to yell out and right. let you know, you know, and then right. you have poor Adam who has to throw those people out. Well, that was one of the most interesting things you told me, Adam, is that you have to throw somebody out of helium at least once a week. Uh, once every two weeks, I think, is about the average. Okay, that's the yeah. average. Once every two yeah. weeks. Yeah, but on like a really hot week, you might have. Yeah, there's there's some weekends where, yeah, it happens two or three times. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so amazing to me. I mean, what do people have to do to get thrown out? What happens more than anything is people will start yelling at the stage. And they're not exactly heckling, but they're being disruptive. And, and they're always drunk and they always think they're helping. Uh, and they're never helping. Uh, Portland, city of helpers. <laughs> Your mom looks so shocked right now. <laughs> and it, Portia's mom's in here. And she, she, you're just so, so shocked anyone would be so impolite, right? Yeah, think how we yeah. feel when it happens. <laughs> they get even more impolite when they get outside of the room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh it is, and I think that's another part of the boom. And also... I think my theory is sort of like the rise of social media culture. Like everyone has a valid opinion now. Everyone mm. has something to say and it right. can be said whenever you feel like saying it. Even when someone is maybe on stage trying to do a job. Like, right. So it's not always like aggressive heckling. A lot of the time people just really think they're helping out. Yeah. Like you need help. You look like you need some help. Right. Let me Let me fix this for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fa and, and and that also goes back to like people who are people who are going because they know it's trendy. But stand up comedy makes a lot of people like physically uncomfortable. Like they feel awkward watching it. So even though we have it totally under control, there's a lot of people that just like don't want to give you that chance. You know, they have an opening or you're silent for a second because you're building a joke, and they feel so uncomfortable in that silence that they have to fill it. And it's just like, comedy's not for you, you wow, know? Wow, yeah. Like, if you feel awkward, then you're never going to like this. Right. You know? If it's you're going to feel like you have to talk every time there's a silence. Yeah, and that's is, real. That's a yeah. real oh, nervousness absolutely. people get. Yeah. yeah. And it's not malicious. It's just... They, do, they don't feel good, so they, they should, have to say something. They should think about rock shows. Exactly. You know? It's very loud there. You know, there's yeah. not a lot of silence, so they should perhaps take that up instead. Yeah. Well, it's probably that same impulse that when, like, there's a lull in conversation, someone will just pull their phone out mm -hmm. and look at it. <laughs> and I think that they just have that same kind of thing in a comedy club where they're ready to just, they just need to fill that void, and there can't be any dips in the energy at any time. Right, right. Yeah. And, that, and that's been an interesting transition as more people do shows in rock clubs, too, because not only is that, like, a very trendy thing to go to, but it's also like, well, this is a rock club. I see bands here, so it doesn't matter if there's a comic on stage. I can still talk whenever I want because this is Mississippi Studios or whatever, you know? Like, it's a noisy bar. I'm supposed to be able to talk. And it's just like, no, you can't. You can't do that here. That's a real problem. We've had that because we record, we've recorded almost all of the comedy albums that we've put out at Mississippi Studios, right. and there's a bar in the back. Mm -hmm. And people just stand at that bar and talk no matter what's going right. on on stage. And you're like, hey, guys, guess what? Did you notice how there's only one person up there? Yeah, one or microphone? even upstairs on that balcony. I mean, yeah. when I went to Cameron's taping and there was that one woman just talking the whole time and yeah. it's just like she's making an album like yeah. you're trying to get a guest spot <laughs> yeah and she really was you got her name she's on the liner notes yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was ridiculous it's but so yeah it's totally it's very odd but yet there we've since we're having that crossover to comedians and rock clubs it is a real problem that we have to think about yeah audiences like, kind of have to be trained yeah they really do and and especially uh, environment has something to do with it but just in general i think comedy audiences because they're new to comedy, they they just have to be trained. They have to learn the ins and outs of being a good audience member. Yeah, 
Totally. And it and it also, I mean, it's nuanced because some comics really thrive in that environment and they love it. Like Mush Casher is a good example. Like he came up in San Francisco and he really got strong doing he's crowd work. Amazing. Like he's so with funny and he's has amazing. Such, yeah, and yeah. he has such well written jokes, but he's also kind of waiting for someone mm-hmm. to say something. Yeah, because that's his strong suit. But that's yeah. not everyone's bag, you know. Like not Maria Bamford doesn't want to engage with a heckler you know she's got a good thing going on like let her get to it (laughs) totally so i think people just feel like oh i saw this one comic who who was really funny every time someone talked so i'm gonna make this show just like that one even though they're totally different humans you know (laughs) and it's like the difference between Maria and Moshe is like going to a rock show or like going to the symphony, you know? It's like not <laughs> which one is which, don't Amy? Behave the same way. Yeah, totally. Adam Triplett is the assistant manager at Helium Comedy Club, and Amy Miller is Portland's funniest person, 2015. Thanks, sure. you guys. Thank, Thank you. is a writer and comedian from Queens, New York, who now lives in Brooklyn, New York. His album, Waiting for 2042, is out now on Kill Rockstars. Hari, welcome to the future of what? Hi, Portia. How I'm are you? So, I'm so glad to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. Yay. Yeah. So for those who do not know, can you explain the title of your album? Yes, I can explain the title. 2042, according to census figures and the news media that keeps reporting them, is the year when white people will be the minority in this country. And so to create a title that I thought would be interesting and draw attention, I called it Waiting for 2042. Yes. <laughs> I like that title. Yes. So today on the show, we are talking about this this idea of, is comedy the new punk rock, right. which you and I have discussed in yes. the past. Yes. And I wanted to read you this quote from Chris Gethardt because I think it's really good. Right. Someone once described punk rock to me as not about violence or crazy outfits, It's people asking why things have to be the way they are. And so I think that is a better way to put it, you know, when we're we're talking about is comedy the new punk rock? Because I really feel like when I go to see a comedian like you or Nathan or Amy that we've had on the show today, that's what's happening is they're saying, why do things have to be this way? Right. I mean, I I don't think comedy is the new punk rock. I mean, I think for me, comedy, some comedy you could classify as punk, potentially, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the the DIY kind of stuff, the fact that it's just you and a microphone in terms of production values, it's so direct in the same way that, you know, punk musicians, you, you know, from, from the history of punk, it's just like, we don't know how to play our instruments, we'll figure it out. We'll right. make it work in any kind of space. Right. Comedians perform in any kind of space. But I wouldn't say it's the, the new punk rock. One, because comedy has its own history. Stand-up has its own history that predates punk rock music. Mm-hmm. You know, has its own history of rebels that predate punk rock music. And also, I think it does a disservice to punk musicians now who are making incredible, you know, there's new punk rock that is the new punk rock, Mm -hmm. right? So there's, you know, there are voices. And certainly, you know, just like anything in capitalism, it gets co opted, right? And so there's tons of punk bands or the idea of punk or the fashion of punk that's been co-opted and mainstreamed and as part of a capitalist enterprise and i think the same is true with comedy you know like they're com is is if we're saying comedy is the new punk rock is larry the cable guy part of the new punk rock maybe not maybe we wouldn't argue that you know he's he's a big corporate force right and he but he's definitely comedy so i i would argue more that there are comedians who have either have punk aesthetics or punk sensibilities. Um, am I allowed to curse on the show? 
I think so. Okay. Because, oh, you know, great. Kathleen Hanna, uh, who, of course, you are very familiar with, legendary Kathleen Hanna, described me and my comedy as, Hari Kundabolu is punk as fuck. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a hell of a compliment coming from Kathleen Hanna. And I thought about that a lot. And I'm like, why would she say that? Because, I mean, I don't see myself as a <laughs> punk artist. But I, I think about it as I'm challenging norms. Mm-hmm. I'm making people uncomfortable. It's not for everybody. Right. The people that are into it are really into it. It connects with them on a deeper level. Punk often cr- allowed for release. And so there, there's not necessarily mosh pits or things of that nature, but there is a release. There's a cathartic release with an audience that understands what I'm talking about and, and with the notes that I am hitting. Well, sure, with laughter. That's oh, a cathartic release. Absolutely. 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 And so I, I think that comedy in that way if, could be seen as as punk, maybe not punk music, but as punk. And I think that's that's a very valid thing to discuss. So yeah, I, I don't think I would see it as the new punk rock. Mm-hmm. I think it has its own space and certainly does do a lot of things that punk had done. And certainly for me, I and I've thought about that a lot, like what kind of punk artist do I want to be? Uh-huh. And I've always made, you know, the dichotomy between the sex pistols and the clash. Let's start early on, right? Right. And I, I want to be the clash. <laughs> I don't want to be the Sex Pistols. Uh-huh. I don't want to just disrupt. Right. I don't want to just make noise. Not that there isn't validity to that. Right. I want to have a clear message with mm-hmm. what I'm doing. I want to make sure people know why I'm doing it and what it is I'm saying exactly. Right. I don't want to just be a racket. And it was a pointed racket. It was noise that was made for a reason. But I want people to know exactly what the reason is. And so certainly, like, you know, that those that's a that's, those are punk sense. That's two different ways of looking at punk music from early on. And I certainly like have chosen a direction that's a clash route. That's what I want. Right. And that's that's totally dovetailing with something that Nathan Brandon just said, because he said he was talking to a conservative audience. He said some stuff. And afterwards, he had some people say, we think you're not American. We think you're right. un-American, <laughs> right, because of what you're saying. And then he said on his way out of the club, he heard a group of people having a debate amongst themselves about what it is to be an American. Right. And he's like, oh, my God, my job here is done. Yes, exactly. Right? Like, that is what I am trying to achieve, like exactly. to get these people talking. And that's why I feel strongly that comedy, at least alternative comedy, at least certain alternative comedians are kind of the new punk rock because I feel like it's getting people talking about the issues that we need to talk about so desperately today that for some reason rock music has left behind. Right. I don't know where rock music is. But right again, now. I think that it hasn't been left behind. It just hasn't been mainstreamed in the way that when punk was starting, you know, it was mainstreamed, right? Like it's corporations that own the radios. It's corporations that own all this technology. It's corporations that are funding major artists. Like there is less diversity, you know, in the mainstream. There's more diversity than ever because of the Internet. But in terms of public voices... You know, I mean, there are punk bands that are making incredible music, some that's very political, some that's still made out of their garage. And so they're the new punk rock and they've and they're continuing that, you know, we can argue what's punk and what's not punk in terms of punk rock music. But I still think that those artists are doing that. So I don't think that necessarily alternative comedy is the new punk rock. But again, it it has the similarities. I mean, I think there's a spirit. There's a reason why when I released the, the record on Kill Rock Stars, I met so many musicians that could connect with me. Mm-hmm. And whether they were, you know, whatever they classify themselves as a punk band or an indie band, it's because we had that in common, similar values, the idea that we're pushing the envelope in our own way, the fact that we didn't need to depend on other people to make it happen. You right. know, like we got a push from a label, which was great, but it was still, you know, it wasn't like we were cultivated and given money from the beginning to create something. We had to fight for it. And so certainly I have felt very connected to musicians who have those sensibilities because of that. And and I see them in some ways as closer to me than other comics. Mm-hmm. Like there's a there's a hip hop group in Seattle called the Blue Scholars. Mm-hmm. And the Blue Scholars to me, like we are brothers. Like we're on the same, you know, I'm friends with Sabzi and Gio. And to me, like that's part of my wave, even mm-hmm. though they're not comics. Right. And artistically, like we share a lot of the same ethos and a lot of what we want out of out of our art and the way we want to impact an audience. And so, you know, what I consider myself, you know, what would I consider comedy the new hip hop or hip hop? I wouldn't, you mm-hmm. know, even though there's spoken word and there's clear messaging more so than maybe, you know, other music because there's it's just you're focusing on the words. But I do see like the ways it connects. Mm-hmm. Or, or the same thing why comedy could be seen as poetry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
It's just an interesting, I mean, the whole thing is so interesting at this point because I feel like comedy has, a, certainly alternative comedy, is experiencing this cultural explosion. For the first time in, in a long time, comedians can do so many things. You know, I mean, podcasting alone yeah. is massive for comedians. And if you think about it, not that many rock musicians or musicians at all have really taken advantage of podcasting. Right. And I was talking to some people about this the other day, and somebody pointed out, you know, if Dave Grohl started a podcast of <laughs> right. himself sitting around right. in his living room talking to his friends, it would get like a million subscribers tomorrow. But you I know, think because people is... are interested in seeing behind the scenes oh, and hearing absolutely. what you're thinking about. But those are, I mean, that's the difference between building a personality and a brand versus like building an artist fan base, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, if people like Dave Grohl, they're going to listen to his podcast. If they like the Dave Grohl, the podcaster, they might not like Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. So it's That's true. I mean, the thing I, I like, you know, I've seen a lot of artists do stuff on SoundCloud and self-release and sign deals with SoundCloud and just put things out. Like Gene Gray puts out records all the time and has a, you know, a, a, a working agreement with, I believe it's with SoundCloud. If I'm wrong, it, it's with another place that also really... Might not be SoundCloud. Whatever it is. The point is that she's found a way to self-release and put things out and, and build with her audience. And it might not be the polished, completely polished record that comes out, you know, with big studio money. Mm -hmm. But it's still a way to reach out to fans constantly. You know, whether it's releasing a mixtape, whether it's, you know, releasing a couple of songs here and there, that is still a way that wasn't the way before. Right. There, there are no politics to like, what's going to make us the most money? What's the best way to put this out? I'm just going to put it out now. So, I mean, I think they, I think musicians have found their own way of building their base without needing someone else's money. Right. Yeah. That's true. I guess I'm just thinking about comedians are sort of ubiquitous right now. So yes. it's like they're ever in podcasts. And then, More than ever. And yeah, and in television, I mean, people are getting jobs as writers on right. really good shows. Right. People are showing up as actors on shows. You know, every time I go to see a movie, T.J. Miller is one of the voices. Right, right. I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> right, Why right, are you right. always in my ear? Right. Like. It's just, it's kind of great. Like, it's this weird renaissance moment for comedy, and yet it's comedy of a specific sort. It's personal. It's like the yes. personal a, as political. I feel like, and then of course, there's people out there like Kurt Brownoller, who's really more just weird. Right. Like, more like but sort he, of. He's playing with the form, though, in exactly. ways that a lot of people haven't. Yeah. Right. So it's, you know, so it's not always we're just talking about race, class, and gender. Right. But it's it's often still it's the personal as political because I am playing with a form. I'm doing something different. I'm bringing something new to this. Right. It's, so it's not just a, such be an the, exciting time. The standard three chords. It's not going to be the same way that it's presented. It's not going to sound like a late night TV set, polished and perfect. Right. It's it's not going to be like whatever comedy you've been taking in for the last decade it's it's going to be different so kurt again fits perfectly into you know the kill rockstars lineup and was the first to release a record and yeah. and it made complete sense to me yeah yeah exactly and it's just been amazing because so many people it's almost like an embarrassment of riches at this point yeah, it's you know it's just everyone i keep going see, to see people and i'm just like oh my god that person's fabulous too right, right and that's so different i mean don't wouldn't you say that 10 years ago that was not the case in comedy or maybe 15. What? The idea of discovering new people or? Just that kind of alternative comedy, like personal as political, putting yourself out there, really saying something. Well, I, th I think it was there before, too. I think it's different now because of the Internet mm. and podcasting and, podcasting and all the things that so comes all with the it. all the channels. All the it. channels for it. So it wasn't like before you would have that, but then you'd, what is that person's name? You can't look them up. You can't right. Google them. Right. There's no websites. Right. There's no, like, you just hope to see them again. And then you hope somebody discovers them and makes them bigger so their stuff is around, right? right. You can't just look up something on YouTube and I want to see more clips of them. So now more than ever, like, you can have somebody doing something distinct that might not be for everyone, but for the people it's for, they'll find you. Mm -hmm. And they'll come to more shows. And they'll buy your record. Right. And I think that's that's the big difference. I think the big difference. I mean, alternative comedy, people challenging norms. I mean, you have Lenny Bruce. You have Bill Hicks. You have Richard Pryor. You have George Carlin. I mean, there's a huge history of that. And there's people on the underground also who've been doing things like that forever. But now, if you do it, you get heard in right. a way. You know, like I have uh, fifty to 60,000 Twitter followers, whatever that means, and a blue check next to my name, whatever that means. <laughs> but would somebody who's doing the stuff I do and like and the things I like to push would I have gotten that much attention I mean pre Twitter pre blue checks whatever would I have gotten that much attention and found a way to influence media on my own 
Right. I wouldn't have. No. And it's because there's this there's this boom in comedy, there's a boom in social media, and there's ways to reach the people you want to reach specifically. Mm-hmm. You know, you can you can find your audience all over the world. Mm-hmm. And that's what what's different. And I think that's a big part of this boom. You know, I, w- I might not have commercials on TV all the time promoting my specials. And I might not have, like, the biggest venues and all these giant promoters. But I have my people, and mm-hmm. they'll find me. And right. that wasn't the case you know, 20 years ago. It was impossible. Right. And I think, you know, when you look at how it used to be, I mean, I'm trying to even picture how you would make a living as a comedian if you oh. didn't get yourself on some kind of touring circuit, you know, something that you a could really... A grueling touring circuit a grueling, that was only clubs. I mean, the yeah. idea of doing other venues. I mean, people had done other venues, but you had to be a bigger comic to do the Fillmore or to right. do these giant things. And now, like, you know, I'm not Chris Rock level. I'm like, you know, a comic that's doing fairly well, but like, I can do the Neptune in Seattle. I could book a rock club in, in Portland. I could book a rock club, like the Independent in, in San Francisco. I did the Troubadour in LA. Like, I have enough people that will come to those things and I don't need to depend on a comedy club to put me up to, to pay my way to, you know, I'll be fine. I'll make more of the cut. Right. You know, I, I don't need to use a comedy club necessarily and have a two drink minimum enforced on people that don't want a two drink right. minimum. You know, comedy clubs are still important and they still certainly build a base in certain places, you know, and I, you know, I perform at Helium in, in Portland and it's been great. And that's also one of my favorite clubs because the intimacy and the way they build the room, how professional they are. But you don't, you know, you don't necessarily need the clubs the way you want to. If I want to do a club, I can do a club. And in some places, if I don't want to do it, I won't. Right. Like in Seattle at this point, you know, I don't really want to do clubs. Like I have enough of an audience, I could do whatever I want. And right. And maybe in San Francisco to some level too if I wanted to. And that's great. Like you're not held hostage by the bookers. You're mm-hmm. not held hostage by certain gatekeepers who judge first from whatever their tastes are, whether you are making it or not. You have your own numbers you can mm-hmm. prove to people that you're valuable. Things go viral. You can find other networks. You don't you don't need some random old white dude with money to say, <laughs> This is it. This is the next right. big thing. I'm gonna make you something. I'm gonna make you. No one can make you anymore in the same way, you That's know? So amazing. You can still I mean, still, of course, if at a certain level you need the push and you need money if you want to make a television show or make something bigger or, or or fund a movie. Even with crowdfunding, it still helps when someone just writes you a check versus a large campaign for a project, right? Right. But at the same time, like I'm not dependent on that. Right. If I wanna make a movie and no one's gonna fund it, I'm gonna get funders. I'll make it myself. And maybe it won't have the same production values, but it'll still get out there. Right, right. Yeah. I think that's so interesting because I don't think it's really the same in music. I think mm. in music, you know, it's it's tr- the internet provides a similar function in music. You know, if you if you make a music and you put it out on the internet, people can find you. Right. People can become fans. Right. But I feel like music and comedy are consumed differently right now, and yeah. they're valued differently. I feel like comedy is valued right now in a very significant way and like we talked about you know when you made your record it's like nobody is going to just listen to one piece of waiting for 2042 they're going to listen to the whole thing they want to hear everything you have to say they don't want to just hear like one tiny a single i mean that's one thing i've discovered like because we've had it on spotify but not the full album we've had bits on it and it ends up leading to more people buying the record because it feels like this is a great bit, but like where else, where is, right. where is this record going? And the record flows like a record, like something from beginning to end is supposed to go together in a certain order. And that right. was very deliberate. And, you know, and some, I think some comics, they're collections of jokes and there's nothing wrong with a, a compilation of your best bits. But I've always loved records that, you know, had these amazing callbacks and had their own arc and narrative to them. Like they're, they, these jokes are supposed to be together because they're trying to say something deeper. And, that's one thing that's been wonderful because even though the album format in a lot of ways I think gets abandoned by the consumer, they just want to hear their one song or their one thing and they don't understand who the artist really is. They just want to hear the one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, MP3s, unfortunately, as great as they are, kind of devalue the full you know, the full collection. But it's been cool with my record. I feel like people are actually going out and getting it and listening to it. And the thing I keep getting, I think, the you know, Bennett Kill Rock Stars has said like, it feels, I don't see as many torrents of your record. It's mm-hmm. not like people are stealing. It feels like people are feeling too guilty to steal your mm-hmm. album and yeah. they want to support it. And yeah. that couldn't have been the case if, a number of years ago. It w- wouldn't have been, I mean, torrents also wouldn't have existed, but it wouldn't have been possible for people to find and then research and get. Yeah. 
Exactly. And value. You know, I think value is really at the core of this yes. because everybody really, so far, seems to value comedy in a way that music has, for whatever reason, whatever historical situation we have right. found ourselves in now, it's like, eh, whatever. You know, I'll just take this MP3. It's in the background. It's in the background. Yeah. It's not as valuable. It's not as... It's not like you're in a car, there's an investment. You're on a, you're on a commute to work and there's an investment. <laughs> the way. You know, you're zoning out when you're listening yeah. to music often. When you're listening to comedy, spoken word, you can't zone out. You, right. you, if you do, you, you go attention. back and listen to it again. It's yeah. what I miss. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think, part of that thing that I think is so special about what's happening right now. Yes. You know, this making the personal political. People are really having something to say. Yes. They're not just making comedy that's background music. Like, no. let me just say some funny dick jokes right, right, in right. the background. And, and those comics are still there and they make a living. And at the end of the day, can I argue with people feeling joy even if I don't find joy in it? You know right, what I mean? Right, like, right. You had a long week, you go to a club, you're hearing your dick jokes, you're laughing, you go home. <laughs> like, you know, and I've also been in the situation of... I you know I'm the comic at the club. You come after a long week. You get a babysitter, and there's a guy talking about colonialism, and you don't want to hear about colonialism <laughs> on a Friday Look, at ten. Tell me some dick jokes, Harry exactly. Kondabolu. <laughs> tell me a jo- oh, there's a feminist <laughs> dick joke. No, tell me a regular dick joke. Right. Um, so I mean, I think that yeah, I mean, there's still value in that, but for the folks who have the voices that maybe don't get heard as often, that don't get mainstreamed in the same way, this is a special time for us. This is uh, an opportunity to like reach more people, and then you know you can't you can't deny numbers and statistics and me selling out shows. You can't deny that like, well, he did fill up all these venues and he <laughs> does do well in all these major cities, and he right. does. I mean, that's kind of an undeniable thing. There are numbers to back how I do, and right. that wasn't the case without certain gatekeepers before. Right, it, it's a really exciting time, and yeah. I can play a punk venue, an alternative venue, and that you know that wasn't a thing people did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Americans love statistics. Yeah. So <laughs> you guys win. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Hari Kondabolu is a writer and comedian originally from Queens, New York. That's right. Now living in Brooklyn. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Portia. And that's our show. The music we played today was used by permission from the artists. You heard songs by Bratmobile, Hella, and The Gossip. And of course, our theme song, Mind Your Own Business by the Delta Five. If you have a question you want answered on the show, please email us at thefutureofwhatshow at gmail.com. Our episodes are archived at killrockstars.com slash thefutureofwhat. And you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Our program is produced by John Sepulvedo and Will Watts. Our engineer is Reed Harvey. Thanks to Digital One Studios in Portland. I'm Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rockstars. See you next week.